third installment of Mariana Trench or Bust, the series where we try to record the deepest parts of our world's oceans without spending millions of dollars. As you remember from last episode, we worked on designing the GPS system as well as the housing subassembly. So for the GPS beacon, we just modified off an off-the-shelf one and made a holder to install it in the top of the housing. And similarly, we made a holder for the camera subassembly to allow us to snap it in on there. Uh, of course, to interface the camera with our electronics, we also made a little circuit board, which we talked about in the previous episode. Now, so far up to this point, we've only been using the 3D printed prototype housings. Of course, these are only for the sake of reference and we really won't be using it for any underwater, uh, well, tests because they aren't waterproof. Uh, so, as you remember in episode one, we did order some metal housings and I'm happy to say that they have, well, finally arrived. They are pretty heavy. Now, this is the main piece, the most expensive one. The housing coupler. It is quite hard to convey the weight. It is pretty, pretty heavy. Of course, it is milled out of a solid block of stainless steel. Uh, and that is, as you can see, just going to be a replacement for the top part. The components that we've designed for fit quite well in there. And initially taking a look at everything, it seems to be manufactured correctly. Moving on to the main housing. This one is pretty heavy. So just like the 3D printed version of it, we do have a pretty thick piece of metal here. So it's quite easy to see here just how thick that stainless steel is. And according to the computer simulations we did a while back, that should allow us to survive the 15,000 PSI. We do also have the dome end caps. I'm not happy, necessarily happy with the way these have turned out. So as you'll see, uh, in order to get the transparent look, what was done to them is they were fire polished. So when they came out of the uh, lathe or whatever milling machine they used, it would have had a pretty matte surface that isn't transparent. To get that transparency, they then put it through a flame, which melted material on the surface layer and allowed it to become a little bit more transparent, but it's still not great. We're gonna to try to do a different technique called vapor polishing, which should give us a much nicer finish. Finally, the other part that we ordered is the simplest one. Uh, so that is the end cap. We did manufacture one out of aluminum last episode just to show how it's done. But realistically, we are gonna be using this one because it is a lot more precise. I'm not that great of a machinist and it is made of stainless steel, which is way stronger. So all in all, the way it would look is something like this. That is perfect. We've got two different types of seals here. So we've got these two radial seals, and those are the ones that will be preventing water ingress at low pressures. And then we've got this face seal that runs around the face that seals these two parts together. And that's gonna be our higher pressure seal because at the higher pressures, as the draw count descends, the two parts will get pushed together very, very hard. And that should technically make that bow ring even stronger. I made these little locking tabs. They should fit in quite well. And if I put it the correct way around, that should allow us to just screw down the bottom part and that will hold both of them in place. That seems to fit fairly well. Let's do the other side. This is shaping up pretty well. 
Now we just need to give it some brains. Since we've got cameras, beacons, and a GPS transmitter that all need to be powered and controlled individually, we'll need to create a custom circuit board. Luckily for you, I've already done that. So here it is. This little circuit board has a pretty large cooling fan at the top, and that'll serve to cool down the cameras, which do overheat fairly quickly when they are recording. Uh, and it also has the power distribution components to power everything correctly from the battery. On the circuit board, we've got a little programmable microcontroller called the Atmega 3209, and that'll allow us to program the uh, functions of the circuit board and determine the time when the cameras turn on, when the beacon turns on, so essentially we'll have full flexibility over all of the settings. And on the bottom of the circuit board, I've got some buttons to quickly adjust settings in case we need to do that in the field. Now, of course, none of this works without a battery. Making a battery usually isn't required, so for your little RC cars or other uh, devices, you can generally buy off-the-shelf batteries and they work perfectly well. Uh, but for our application, since we do have a pretty strange uh, constraint here, which is, well, a cylindrical uh, enclosure, it would be best to make our own pack, battery pack, in order to maximize the amount of power we're getting out of that volume. Battery packs are made out of individual cells. So here we have a uh, 18650 cell, which is a very common type. In order to connect cells, simply take a little thin piece of metal sheeting like this, and then use a welding machine such as this one, which basically creates a short circuit and melts the sheet to the battery. As you can see, that tab isn't going anywhere and provides a really nice low resistance connection. In order to actually build our battery pack, we do need to figure out what sort of cell configuration we want, first of all. Doing some very basic calculations, we can figure out exactly how much battery capacity we need. So, if we know the power draw of our camera system, and the lights, for example, and the voltage that they are going to be operating at, we can quite easily plug that into some equations and figure out what sort of uh, capacity we would need for our battery. Uh, depending on the runtime. So we're aiming for a runtime of at least 12 hours. So if we're operating at eight volts, which is a two cell configuration, that would require us to have 17 amp hours or 17,000 milliamp hours of capacity. Each of these little 18650 cells give you around 3000 milliamps or three amp hours of capacity. So we would effectively need at least six. That's good because we can fit up to nine on each layer of our enclosure, so that'll give us a good amount of headroom. In terms of securing the batteries, we do need to also consider the safety aspect. Although we could definitely just take some tape and wrap the batteries around, holding them together that way, that wouldn't be very safe since they would be rubbing against each other. So the best way is to have a little bit of space between the batteries. I've come up with this little cylinder design, which fits very, very well within our enclosure. So as you can see, it barely takes up, well, barely leaves any free space and allows us to pack nine of those batteries together. Those are all connected together now, so once I do the same on the other side, it'll effectively make it one larger cell with a 24,000 milliamp hour capacity. And that finishes up the electronics, at least for now. Before we can do a proper field test, we're gonna have to implement the final hardware aspects of the drop cam, and most notably, we need to attach the phone. These phone blocks are, well, just that. They are blocks. They don't have any attachment mechanism, so I'll have to figure out some sort of way of attaching the drop cam to the phone. I've got two of these identical foam blocks, so what I'm thinking of right now is to attach them on either side of the drop cam. It isn't as simple as just bolting them on because I need to make sure that I am attaching them in an orientation in a height that allows the top of the drop cam to remain above the surface of the water when it resurfaces rather than just lying flat. If it's lying flat, then the GPS beacon as well as the LED beacon could be submerged underwater, which makes them pretty much useless. When I was designing the top housing, I did leave some space for accessories to be mounted. So that's exactly what I'm going to use right now. I printed some mounting points, uh, these little plastic pieces that allow me to screw one side onto the housing and the other side onto the foam block. Okay. 
On the side of the foam, I have printed the corresponding mount and screwed it in using some longer screws that do go through most of the thickness of the foam block, so it should be on there very nice and tight. As you can see, the two mounts mesh together just like that, and then a pair of screws uh, mounted on the sides lock everything in place for a very nice solid fit. We definitely don't want these coming off because, well, if they do, the drop cam's not coming back. Halfway through filming this video, I realized I made a pretty big mistake in the calculations for how much foam we would need. So instead of ordering more foam and making it even more bulky, I decided to get the housing components remanufactured out of a lighter metal. Uh, so this is made out of aluminum 7075. It's comparable in strength to steel, however, not as strong as steel, but it is quite significantly lighter. This means that these foam blocks will have enough buoyancy to support this lighter housing, which should be good because we do want to go and test them out as soon as possible. Since I am in a bit of a time crunch to get this all ready as soon as possible since I did already book the flights to LA, I don't think I have enough time to create the electronic weight release system, so for now I'm going to be using a very simple method of just having a dissolving salt linkage between the drop cam and the weight attached. It's a pretty foolproof method that has worked pretty well in the past, so for these shorter deployments, I think that'll be totally fine. I already attached a few of the last remaining pieces of hardware, such as this rope holder, which will make attaching the weight and salt release a lot easier. In addition to that, I also 3D printed some supports for the foam, just to make sure that they are being supported on this side of the drop cam. And that just about wraps it up for this episode. It's a little bit of a shorter one this time, but that's because we're planning something really special for you in the next episode where we finally go to LA and test out the drop cam. So stay tuned for that and I'll see you very soon.